What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. Help other people to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores Cannon has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT. Now you can learn her method by going directly to themoreshow.com forward slash QHHT. And don't forget to mention the discount coupon More Talks. Nathaniel Gillis, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kevin. It's been a while, and it's always an honor to be with you. Yeah, you came on, uh, what was it now, 2020. So I'll link that previous show below as well for anyone that might want to watch that as well. Uh, just give us a bit of a background on yourself for those who may not have come across your work as well. Please, Nathan. Yeah, so uh, my first experience with the phenomenon I'm researching was when I was eight years old. Uh, my family moved into a new house, and that house was haunted. <laughs> and uh, so I witnessed full-bodied apparitions, shadow figures, and a whole host of manifestations by this entity. And it inspired me to, to get into the field of what's called hauntology and the study of the afterlife and disembodied consciousness. And so uh, what I'm doing now is uh, is researching malevolent entities, their pathologies, their victimologies, and hopefully uh, gather information and insight into who they are, what they're doing, and who they're doing it to. Okay, so how has your work changed? Because I think last time when you came on, there was that idea that people could contact yourselves if they had a case or they were they felt that they were being affected by something demonic, then you would, um, um, you know, you could communicate with them and, you know, I, I don't want to say it was a service, right? But you did, you've, you, you've, you've performed exorcisms, not the, you know, through the Catholicism way in a sense, but you have been doing that. But that's not something you do anymore, is it? No, no, I, I used to. And it's kind of funny. It's I think the last cleansing or what they call cleansing I did uh, was uh, around this last time we did a show. So it's been years. Uh, since then, I've been basically uh, just diving headfirst into the literature, looking at various case studies, uh, hoping to find behavioral patterns that will unify these case studies, you know, not, not just who these beings are, but what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, you know, and one of the reasons why I stopped doing cleansings is because it was just taking a toll on me. Uh, being in contact and involved with these malevolent entities, it was just, uh, it was too much. I, I had had... I had had uh, case studies where the experiencers were emailing me, telling me that their guides told them to tell me, you know, hey, my guide said that they're going to be waiting for you when you die. And so once I got involved in this work, it, it affected me deeply to the point where I had to take a break from cleansings and get the sticky feel off of me and just dive headfirst into the literature. Because I think that, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm more valuable when it comes to understanding these case studies than I am when I'm actually in the house dealing with them. Were some of these cases, were you, were you kind of like taking them home with you in a sense? Were you, was this energy with you? In that a way. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. In a way, uh, you know, in the darkness, it's, it's gross darkness, right? It's, it's not just a uh, presence there. I mean, I've had people call me at three in the morning <laughs> The entity that was in their house convinced them to call me and say A, B, and C. So uh, they got to a point where it was an existential threat to me. And so I had to separate myself. Uh, not that I won't go back to it. I mean, I, I do have friends that are also in the field that do in-home cleansings. Uh, but like I said, I think right now my time is more valuable to me 
uh, when I'm in a safe spot <laughs> and I'm just reading the case studies. And I, not to say that here in the future that I won't go and, and apply some of the lessons I've learned, you know, in homes. But I think for now, I want to know more about these entities before I engage with them again. So what is it that you're engaging with or you had engaged with? What, what, are, what is this? In a, how do you sum it up? I mean, is it just there are light beings and there are other beings that we would call dark that, you know, don't want anything positive for us or lost in, on their journey or they, they know exactly what they're doing or what, what would you call this other energy? Well, I call them molters. Uh, these are the beings that are behind malevolent possessions. Many of them are, are manifesting in hauntings. And there is a direct correlation between out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences. And uh, there are even case studies where whatever these things are have created almost a simulated near-death experience. And so what my interest has been as of late is trying to understand their pathologies and their victimologies, anything that, that they always do, right? You know, is because I, I've noticed that there are certain behavioral patterns that stand out more than others. Their, their victimologies are often the same. Uh, more than that, I wanted to understand what they had a faith in and a fear of. You know, when I first got into this work, even just dealing with entities that are negative, uh, I realized they had their own belief systems. They had their own traditions. They had their own language preferences. And, and the deeper I got into the literature... Uh, it's, it was very easy to realize that uh, these beings have their own culture. They have their own values. And, and my job as a researcher is to see through the thin veil and perceive them in that way. Not as just, okay, we're just going to, you know, struck them on and say, okay, yeah, they're all negative and just say A, B, and C and they'll, be, they'll leave. It's not true. You know, when we interact with these beings, they will often mask themselves. Um, and we can get into some of my case studies regarding that phenomenon. But my, my focus now has been, who are they? Why are they? And what is their interest in us as a species? I had someone on recently, Vicky Joy. I don't know if you've heard that name. And um, she, she had a book published by um, L.A. Marzuli, I think it is. L.A. Marzuli. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And um, her work kind of uh, is was you know in your field as well, and uh, mm -hmm. she says some some interesting things, really interesting things, which maybe we'll touch upon with your work. But just how they have an agenda in a sense. There's an agenda here, right? Correct. And they do, and there's they seem to be operating off of a timeline, and that's another aspect of the phenomenon that my colleagues and I are trying to understand. Uh, but more than anything, Kevin, it, it's literally these uh, these entities are masters of deception, masters of deception. And what we're trying to understand in the field is, is OK, how do we test the spirits? You know what I mean? I mean, sure, we have entities that can appear to us as ghosts and the new E.T. or guides or, or something. Uh, but how do we test them to know what their intentions for us are? Right. You know, and so that's what we're after at this point. And uh, we're trying again, we're trying to see through the veil. But more than anything, we're trying to get data, not dogma. We've had enough dogma. We want the real raw data in order to understand what's going on, because if, in fact, they are operating on the timeline, then we're running out of time ourselves. And do you think there's a connection between that and some of the other paranormal phenomena that's out there as well that people have an interest in? 100%. You know, in my field, I'm, on, I'm asked the most popular question to date. Are aliens demons? Are demons aliens? How does this all fit together? Uh, one thing that is glaringly obvious is that there is an intelligence behind uh, both fields of research. And this intelligence has been, been, been manipulating our species uh, since primordial history. And I believe the data is leading me to believe, I should say, that this intelligence has used a mask, one as a demon and the other mask as an extraterrestrial. But once you see behind the veil, you'll realize that there's something even more demonic than a demon and something more alien than an extraterrestrial that's behind all of this. And so really what we're looking at, and, and like I, I tell people, hauntology and ufology, 
They're not dichotomies. They're dualities of the same phenomenon. But what we've learned to do throughout history is compartmentalize both fields of research. And again, I believe that the, the phenomenon is behind that. They, they do not want us to understand who and what they are. What is one of the main agendas, do you think? Uh, the self-replication of their species. Uh, you know, I think, again, if we look at possession case studies in demonological literature, you'll start to realize that it's not limited to the Catholic definition of possession or even the Kabbalistic version of it. You have to look at it uh, on a macro level. You'll see that possession itself was not just the relocation of consciousness. It was the replication of life. In other words, that this whatever these things were, I called them altars, but again, they would possess people in order to have a new body to inhabit. And so I believe that plays a major role in this phenomenon. And even more than that, when you get into incubi succubi case studies, you see how uh, ufology, especially UFO abduction phenomenon, mirrors these case studies. I mean, almost into, it's they're twins. <laughs> and uh, so what I've been doing lately uh, is, is trying to understand not just their pathology, but their sexual pathology. What's their victimology like? I've had case studies uh, where these beings have manifested as uh, boyfriends, husbands, and, and in order to deceive. And then once the act of copulation occurs, they're done. The entity changes its shape and it leaves. Uh, so, so that's a, a huge red flag for me because these kinds of case studies... Uh, especially incubi, entities that look like men and appear to women. Uh, we've seen and experienced these for thousands of years. So my main point right now is that this is not a new phenomenon. This is an ancient phenomenon being interpreted in a new way. And I hope that makes sense. It does. Do you think we knew more back in the day and that we've, well, maybe not purposefully, but whatever these things are have led us to... You know, just believe that, you know, in the fairy tales, in right. Old Testament, uh, you know, go towards more of the science. Don't worry about the mythology of it, in a sense. Um, do you think that's purposeful? Yes, I do. I think there is a control mechanism, or as Jacques Vallée calls it, a, a power structure to which they want to control our perception of them. Uh, I've had case studies where uh, an individual I just recently worked with where he uh, he had broke up with his girlfriend he had moved across the a town and he got a new apartment a new job a new new life basically and uh this girlfriend knocks on his door one night how did you get my address right i haven't talked to you in months and so uh the girlfriend seduces him and uh he wakes up in the middle of the night and she's gone and so a couple of weeks go by, and so he picks up his phone, dials from number, and says, you know what? It's been bugging me. How did you even get my address? And she starts yelling at him. I don't even know what you're talking about. I was out of town. I'm not, I, <laughs> that wasn't me. So this, this, again, this mimic aspect of the phenomenon is deeply troubling uh, because what it just does, though, it, is imply, it implies such a knowledge base on their part about us that we can no longer afford to ignore. You know, they, they can create entire theatrical performances in order to get us, and I'm going to use this word loosely, to consent to whatever their agenda is. And uh, it's like I told you before the show, I mean, not only can they appear as Deer and Edna, and they have, uh, but they've appeared as Jesus, they have appeared as Muhammad, they have appeared as authority figures, and so what I've learned to do is, again, not look at what we're seeing, because many, in many cases, we're blinded by our own vision. We have to look beyond and see what the true agenda is, not just the mask they're wearing at the time. Do you think they're connected with uh, people of power? In a way, in a way, I, I do believe in Malachi Martin's hypothesis of perfect possession. And we see that in, in, in not serial killer case studies, uh, but people who will go their entire lives as deacons in churches or a doctor or some very wealthy business executive, uh, you know, a loving man, a loving woman, and all of a sudden something snaps in them and they demonstrate a victimology and a preternatural knowledge 
of people's lives that they would have they would have never had outside of something walking into their skin, fulfilling certain uh, things on their agenda, and then leaving. So I do believe in the sense that there are entities that do possess people in power, and they will operate according to their own agenda. So when we talk about consent, let's um, well let's go to the cases of even kids. I mean, we've got the make believe friends, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes when we look back, if we ever did this in our life, um, we may find that, well, some may find that what they were interacting with actually wasn't of the most positive um, form, right? Yet right. there was still consent at some level uh, to let that in, but it's, it's difficult to see that from a child's perspective. How do you, or maybe you could put that into your case when we talk about your beginnings in this right when it comes to your childhood do you think you consented on any level to what happened to you as a kid and just tell the audience what you experienced so when i was a, a child i was eight years old i say eight and a half because at that time it mattered you know the hats always matter when you're a kid um yeah but uh you know it was at the open house originally that i encountered the entity it was uh, hiding underneath the bed and I, I saw a full-bodied apparition of a little girl. And uh, that's the shape and form this being took in order to bait me, literally, into a friendship, a relationship of some sort. And so what this does, though, is gets, this gets back to a, a very strange happening that's occurring in the field. See, if we're dealing with entities that are all powerful, right, then there would be no need for seeking uh, consent, or even, and I use this again loosely, there would be no need to groom us into consent. You know what I mean? It, it would be, okay, I'm going to do what I want to do, whether you want to like it or not, and you don't have a, a choice in the matter, but that's not what's happening. Uh, I, I've had cases where uh, women were being abducted or kidnapped by these beings, and they called on Jesus, and it, it, Jesus shows up, but he's not the historical Jesus of the first century, right? He, he's just like the Swedish Presbyterian, version of Jesus never existed in history. Uh, but again, that was according to that individual's belief system. What would Jesus look like in your mind? And that's how the being appeared. So there is this role-playing aspect of the phenomenon that is, is great interest, of great interest to me and my colleagues, again, because it seems to be this theatrical production where, where it does seek permission, it does seek consent, and that's something that is of great importance to me in understanding. Right, absolutely. So can you look back and say, well, I think maybe I did consent to that? Or could the consent be that, you know, this actually wasn't nothing to do with you and this came from another family member and actually it's a lineage kind of thing? Yes, I think that the consent has everything to do with the way we think and our thought patterns. You know, uh, and this is one of the concepts within Catholicism and their doctrine of demonology that I, I do respect, and that is that there's a war going on for our minds. And so in my case, specifically me personally as a kid, uh, it was a war of intellect. Uh, the being, the, like, I would get thoughts in my mind all the time. And so what would happen was, without me even understanding the nuances of what was occurring to me, uh, they would send a thought, and then I would believe it, right? And then once I believed it, that gave that being consent to, again, take a deeper and stronger hold in my mind. And so what possession does, is, in a way, is the being literally wants to think for you without you fully understanding what's going on. And that's why when you have certain case studies of murders or, or someone who demonstrates pathology and victimology, uh, it's literally like that being is wearing them like a skin. And in demonology, we would call that a social skin or a biological avatar. But it cannot do that unless there is some kind of mental consent given to them to where now they're thinking for you and not just with you. So where did this lead you then? What was the uh, overall experience that you went through? Uh, the entity that, was, that I was battling was suicide, I believe. It was something that uh, it fed on fear. And one thing that I learned that was very intriguing to me to this day even uh, was that it would almost manufacture fear. It would project terror 
and then and then ask you basically if you believe it. Do you believe you should be afraid of me? And then once you agree with that, then again you've created this covenant of consent. You fear it, and so in in, in the fearing of it. You're agreeing with the fact that it should be feared. And again, that being feeds off of that. So there are entities that are parasitic in nature that will cause terror. And I'll give you a case study after this. That will cause terror in someone's life and then feed off of the fear it created. There's a sort of, you know, control there as well, isn't there? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the overall picture to turn people away from the light in a sense of of what they could do with their life is it to we, we're talking about i guess it's to feed off them but it's also you know if there's an agenda is is it to um make the world in their vision in a sense yes they want to make us in their image now that image may include their culture their belief system their language preference uh we still don't know but uh getting to a case study uh just real quickly um i was reached out to by a family and uh, their 22-year-old daughter, this was during COVID, and their 22-year-old daughter was suffering from nightmares, and she was so debilitated. I mean, she was sick to her stomach. She was having gastrointestinal issues. They took her to the emergency room. And uh, so at, at this point, it's 2.30 in the morning. The daughter's in the hospital. The family is, they're not allowed to go in there because of COVID restrictions. And uh, so they asked me, you know, can you help us? Like, what's going on with our daughter? And so I, I start to um just do what i do and i i asked him i said well i said i, I think I, I think i know what's going on i said uh, two or three years ago i said your daughter was uh she experienced i didn't go into much detail but i said your daughter experienced something extremely physical and something very traumatic and i said that's where this entity came from and i said here in about two weeks i said i would like you to sit her down and suggest to her what i've been telling you what it what what actually happened to you when did this when did this entity manifest to you so that occurred once they got out of the hospital they took her back to the house and they asked her these questions she said that uh, she was invited to a a uh what is it a party at a a, uh, college campus and at that party when she went upstairs to use the restroom a big burly man grabbed her pulled her into the room and assaulted her now this is vitally important she said since that night she was having recurring nightmares and in these nightmares a male entity would step into her room she said it it wore the same clone it had the same masculinity had the same persona and she said and and since then i have i've received very little sleep and she said it's begin manifesting physically and so once they got her some therapy and close that mortal portal, that entity left. But my point here being is that these be- these creatures, well, again, they will create certain scenarios in lives and use the trauma they inspired, almost as a, like I said, a mortal portal in which to manifest in that individual's life. So once you deal with the trauma, you close that door, the entity no longer has authority. I think that's very important. What about those practicing or messing around with black magic? Well, I think, you know, it's a lot like going out in the middle of the night and saying, hey, Uncle Ted, are you there? And, you know, another Ted shows up or an entity that claims to be Ted shows up. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Uh, It's like I said before, I mean, if we're dealing with creatures that know when people die, they do. They know what kind of clothes people died in. They do. Uh, in, in even entities that can create near-death experiences in order to, to communicate with us one-on-one. If we're dealing with a species, even if it's a species of spirit that has that ability, uh, what, in fact, are we risking trying to contact them? Well, yes, yeah, some people, uh, I guess, <laughs> you know, just feel that they want to... <laughs> well, I want to use the right word, here, but I have a curiosity, I guess, and uh, sometimes when you open that door, um, it's not always the best thing to do. Uh, I'm sure it's quite destructive what comes through in the end. It is. And there's this, uh, again, it's not a new phenomenon. It's an old phenomenon being interpreted in a new way. But this whole CE5 movement uh, and this fallacy that just falls on its face, even with the smallest critique, you see it fall apart in our hands. And that is this theory that our intentions with them determine their intentions with us. We don't even trust strangers in that manner. 
we wouldn't tell our kids to take candy from strangers because what, right? Even as good of a child as that may be, that doesn't mean that's a good person giving them candy. So what, what, what we're doing, though, again, is that we're leveraging ourselves as a species, our consciousness, in order to communicate with the other. But we don't know what the other is. Now, what we do know, according to case studies, uh, is, is very much so uh, that these, these beings can appear in any way they want to. Um, there was one case study of Ted Rice. He was a psychic healer that worked with the late Dr. Colic Turner. And Ted Rice was being guided by his deceased grandmother for 26 plus years, my friend. And in the 20s, in the last year, the being who was so-called is his, his mother uh, told him to do something that went against her religious creed. So, so what we're trying to do right now in the field is how do we test these beings? Yeah, and that's interesting you know, that you you know you bring that connection in. Sorry to interrupt that, that you bring that connection in with the whole UFO subject as well. Do you think there's anything positive about the UFO subject in the sense that it, that it's not always this negative side that's coming through? Well, I think there are uh, there are case studies where healings and so-called miracles have occurred, uh, but if we are going to at least hypothesize about these beings all underneath the umbrella of one phenomenon, right? If, if they're all manifestations of a singular intelligence, uh, then we can start allowing ourselves the freedom, right? To look at ontology. Ontology has case study after case study of these beings showing up in small balls of light. That's the same aspect in ufology, right? I mean, we have uh, experiencers even now, one famous experiencer that's saying, okay, there are beings that are crawling out of orbs now. Now, <laughs> That's not new. It's new to ufology because they've compartmentalized the phenomenon into ontology and whatever we want the other to be. Uh, but we have case studies like that in ontology. Dr. Barry Taft had a case study in the uh, San Pedro haunting with Jackie Hernandez, where they had literal blood plasma leaking from the cupboards. Tried to hang Jeff Wheatcraft, the videographer. Okay? Now, that entity floated into the room in an orb, it wasn't a speck of dust. It was an actual orb about the size of a basketball and in a, a half of an operation on a full body, but the torso up moved right out of the ball of light. So again, what we're witnessing now, though, is if we if we include case studies from both ontology and ufology, then we all, we start to realize that, hey, there's a, a higher intelligence behind both phenomena that have been working each against each other. And it's it's one of the more troubling aspects of the research. Yeah, I mean, there's those researchers in the UFO field that have gone more towards the conscious side as well. And, you know, they see, well, it seems to be very positive. But, um, you know, I mean, we <laughs> there's, there's been no disclosure yet. And, and when, you, when you really look into the whole UFO side, it really is, um, uh, well, it, it's beyond our understanding, isn't it, m most times? Right. Yes, uh, we're still, like I tell people, we're groping in the darkness right now. We're, we're struggling to even articulate because we, we, we lack the vocabulary, right? We lack the vocabulary needed to even structure sentences about what, when, and where they are. I tell people they're present with us, but they're absent from us. And, and the, I think it's, it's really interesting, too, to, to see how much access they have in us as a species. I mean... Uh, we were conversing about this prior to the show. I mean, we have these beings that would literally peel people out of their bodies. They would, con they, not conjure, I guess, but they, maybe they do. But they would inspire by location, witnessed by others, where we'll just be talking or they'll be talking to someone. And all of a sudden, someone, they, they will be peeled out of their body. What is going on? And at what point, and this is where I'm at my research, at what point does that out-of-body experience create ghosts out of the experiences yeah. this makes sense because if, if we're dealing with a species that has that ability that evidential interest uh then i think that we need to be more guarded with our intent i mean i, I why would i want to communicate with them you understand my, my position here um but i think it's disturbing and i'm not I, some people call me alarmist perhaps i am but i think that this research is so new that I don't think that we can trust them like we can the neighbor across the street.
Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, I've I've had a, a CE five experience with with a with a group once. It was interesting. I mean, they they pulled something in, <laughs> and um, we all witnessed it. But it was very quick. Um, right. I can't really, to say I understood what it was. I guess that's what that phenomenon is doing, isn't it? It's it's, it's, put, it's communicating with and pulling in something from um, maybe a d- dimensional is not the right word, but it's almost like it opens up a portal. Yes, there are aliens from outer space and demons from inner space. We're trying to distinguish the difference between the two. Now, a, a more, I, I think I should say a more interesting point for me, again, is uh, this whole CD5 thing. It's Again, it's a new interpretation on an old phenomenon. This is nothing, uh, this is nothing uh, novel right now. It's novel to people because they don't know the literature of these case studies. It's new to them. But it's not a new phenomenon in and of itself. Uh, in the 16th century, we had case studies that are just like these right now in the present, uh, where uh, small groups of people would go out into cemeteries or they would hide in basements and perform rituals. And they decided, they decided, not because of evidence, but they decided that their intentions with the phenomenon will determine the phenomenon's intention with them. Makes, makes no sense. But what was happening, if I can make this real quick, uh, what was happening, though, is that these beings were performing what we would consider to be CE5 rituals. And what they realized is these, that they in themselves, they were not the ones conjuring the beings. They were the ones being conjured by the beings. And so the whole theory that I'm operating off of, and I'm getting passionate, forgive me, again, we don't know who the conjurers are. And so in these case studies, this is called the Dibuk phenomenon in the 16th century, uh, the victimology began with women, which is the same right now in the UFO phenomenon right now. It's the same thing. And what was happening is, again, these people would meet together in secret societies and they would uh, reach out to these beings. And what was occurring to them, it's it's fascinating, but it's troubling. Uh, these same women that were, were going out and trying to conjure these beings, they would go to bed at night and some th- these entities that they conjured would step into their dreams and, and, and perform tests in a very clinical manner on these women and even inseminate them. You're going to see the UFO abduction phenomenon all over this. Inseminate them with the fetus. But, right, it, it began at CE5. Next thing you know, these poor women are waking up and going to work and their mind, they're thinking, okay, that was a really bad nightmare. That was a really bad dream. And then when they would go to work, they would look at their wrists and their legs and they would find ligature marks by these entities. Me, what am I saying? What are you saying? Okay, what I'm saying is, uh, again, these beings step into their dreams and use the nightmare scenario to perform the same rituals that we're seeing in the UFO abduction phenomenon. Absolutely. I mean, you couldn't really, I don't think you could have that discussion or maybe they, someone like Stephen uh well, some call him Stephen Greedy, <laughs> but Stephen Greer um, would be able to have with you because uh, um, that's not the experience that he's having with it. But that, that that's his mm-hmm. understanding of it. Mind you, he's more into the nuts and bolts and, uh, you know, um, getting the whistleblowers out there if they are to right. believed to be true. <laughs> right. Um, mm-hmm. I think he brought up 700 whistleblowers on the last um, um, disclosure that he did. And that just seems, uh, and, and, well, and mo- most of these whistleblowers were, you know, they, they had no names. <laughs> um, right. But, um, y- yeah, and, and what credibility had, uh, an ER doctor's got to be talking to the CIA about subjects like that? <laughs> that I, I doubt it. I think if you went to some of these people that he supposedly talked to, I, I think they would say... Um, mm-hmm. I think he's making that up. <laughs> but yes, I mean, it's just a pretty, just a money grab. But yeah. Um, but let me move on a little bit here as well. In your research, you talk about uh, fallen angels mm-hmm. and then the a- UFO alien phenomena. What, what, what is the difference? Do you think it's just something that's been rehashed? I think rehashed. It's, it's just another role that they're playing. I would remind everybody that uh, the Collins Elite, first of all, let me preface what I'm going to say. Real quick, uh, there was a group of physicists from the Department of Defense. They were called the Collins Elite. And uh, as researchers, their their goal was to uh, to connect any and all phenomena 
And so essentially they said, okay, are, are these beings demons? Are they fallen angels? Are they extraterrestrials, right? And so what they were doing is they were looking at the occult connection to these entities. And so one of their uh, experiences they had worked with was a witch called Sybil Lee. And uh, she wasn't, I shouldn't say she was a witch. I don't, she called herself a witch, but she really wasn't, you know, when people hear witch nowadays, oh my God, you know, something really bad. No, uh, she was just more somebody that was really connected to the spirit world. Well, anyways, uh, they sat down in her home in Los Angeles and uh, her being a contemporary to Aleister Crowley, they asked her, can you, can you channel and contact the beings that Aleister Crowley was in contact with? This is a huge point that has to be made because it's overlooked by many in the field, even frowned upon. You know, if, if it doesn't fit in their blueprint of the phenomenon, it doesn't exist and it shouldn't. Right. But anyways, sure enough, she lit her candles, went into her ritual, and, uh, and the entity took control over her and they began to interrogate it. Who are you? Are you extraterrestrial? And the entity started laughing at them and verbally abused them, you fools. Of course, we're not extraterrestrial. This is our latest deception. Now, if we're to, if we're to agree with her or even to take her testimony uh, as true, uh, then we, we see that, okay, that again, this is just a new mask of deception. Uh, it's a new phenomenon or a new mask, the old phenomenon. Uh, but, you know, are they fallen angels? Well, I think that when we get to biblical literature, uh, what is a fallen angel? What's, what's fallen about an angel? And the deeper you get into it, the very first hypothesis of what a fallen angel was, it comes from the Malakum, and it's a Ugaritic text. It was found in a ritual bowl. And so before we heard the Greek word angel, you had the Malakim in Hebrew, and it was a deceased ancestor. Right? It wasn't just, okay, some semi-divine being. No, it was, they were referring to, this is the theory, the, the oldest working theory. What they were referring to was the evolution of consciousness. Where some people die, and they evolve; others die, and they they mutate. The very and it's so funny because I reached out to a career psychologist years ago, and um, I guess he thought I was—I shouldn't say it like this—but I guess he kind of thought I was a demonologist in the sense of here's a take two prayers, call me in the morning. Not really someone you know who was trying to get into the the literature aspect of it. Uh, but I said, you know, what? I'm, I'm researching fallen angels and demonology, so I don't believe in demons and, and fallen angels. I'm thinking, well. If you understood it through the most ancient lens, right, evolved consciousness, then what we would be doing right now as demonologists would be uh, hoping to understand the afterlife and uh, consciousness in general. So let's just go to a few case studies maybe, or just, well, at mm -hmm. least one. Yeah, there was one case study that you worked on recently when it was um, – well, it was a murder, and I'll let you just go into uh, what you uh, what you discovered in that case. Yes. Uh, so I had uh, received an email from a family that would requested prayer. Now, my dad's a pastor. They thought they were they were reaching out to my father, right? Hey, Pastor Gillis, we need some prayer. Well, um, I asked them, okay, uh, I said, okay, what do you need prayer for? And they said, well, we're we're experiencing a large amount of violent paranormal activity in our house. So then my dad said, well, that's kind of your field. You go ahead and take care of us. So I did. Uh, but in reaching out to the family, we, we talked on the phone. And uh, I had no real context outside of paranormal activity. I had real, no real context as to what occurred in the house. But when I, when I first arrived at the home, there was an atheist that met me at the door. And his first words were, hey, Nate, which if I don't know you, you don't know me, right? I'm not Nate. I'm Nathaniel. So I knew. I knew a red flags were going up and going, oh, no, what am I going to experience now? Um, hey, Nate, I just want you to know I don't believe in you. I don't believe in spirits. I don't believe in the afterlife. I believe none of that. And he's like, I just want you to know that. I'm thinking, okay, fine. Well, what had occurred in that family's life uh, was that there were the daughter, in fact, it was a daughter that became good friends with a 15-year-old at school. And they conspired to kill her family. And uh, that's when the paranormal activity began prior to the murder and then even more so afterwards. And so uh, the husband and the wife, they were uh, they would be sitting on the couch watching television. They both work second shifts. They're they're watching television wee hours of the morning. 
And uh, they looked out the window and there's the 15 year old staring at them. They called the police, the police come look around, the girl's gone. Well, uh, a few weeks later, the daughter walks downstairs, opens the door. And when she opened the door, the 15 year old had a mask on. There was a male guttural disembodied voice coming out of her. And uh, a murder took place. And what was very interesting to me, uh, even more so, obviously I wanted to help the family, but I also wanted to document the phenomenon, right? In hopes that I can understand what's going on more so. That way in another case study, I can apply what I learned in that one, right? And help the other, another family. Anyways, um, they had cut out the carpet and uh, they were seeing shadow figures, orbs, uh, something was knocking on doors, walking in the house at nighttime. And so when I did the cleansing, it was something very unique happened. It, the, the atmosphere became very charged with energy and it became very hot, so much so that the husband was doing this, he said, get it off me. It was, but you could feel it burning almost. And when I, when I performed the cleansing, it was almost like something slowly turned the lights on. You could just see it leave. Now, uh, about two months later, I was sitting in the same restaurant in the same seat as I was when I got the original email from the family. And a couple to my left sit down next to me. I'm reading a book. I always read. And uh, the woman next to me, she begins to ask me questions about what I'm reading. And then we get into what do you do? And I told her what I do. Okay. Uh, you know, have you had any recent case studies? I didn't go, obviously, not in detail. Right. You know, I won't do that, but I will give you the basic tenets of it. Uh, anyways, uh, I, you know, I did the cleansing and, and thankfully the paranormal activity, paranormal activity stopped. And she, she said, you're Nathaniel Gillis. I said, uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, right? Yeah, I don't know at this point. She goes, oh, yeah. She goes, I know you. I said, how do you know me? She said, I'm the social worker that was working with both of the minors. And she said, the night that you did the cleansing, uh, she said she got a phone call from the jail cell. One of the girls told her that the entity that had been taking her and manifesting to her at nighttime told her, I no longer have authority over you. I have to leave. So something occurred from the the actual initial cleansing and it manifested in such a way where again I, I still don't know what happened uh but that entity told her i no longer have authority and so that was the social worker that had been working with the miners at that point which blew my mind mind you i thought what <laughs> that's incredible i bet you a lot of murders that i bet you you know there's something uh working there isn't there i th I think you know if something's got that much energy that it's going to happen as in you know things are aligning for the murder to happen right, right. I, I i wonder how many cases if you were to look at them actually have something could you know demonic hanging around <laughs> almost like when people say that whisper in my ear you know do it do it you know you know you want to do it do you know what i mean um but how many people have said that they heard voices now yes you could say well that's their you know get out of jail card or, or at least to for their own, you know, selfish reasons. But there's so many people that say that. Yeah, I think it's an excuse that a lot of people try to pull to get out of jail, you know, to get out of jail free card, the devil may be doing it. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't real, genuine case studies. Uh, I mean, if you look, I think we talked about this in the last show, and this will probably be the only thing that we, that I, I can cover again on the show. Um, but it was Jeffrey Dahmer and his only living victim. Uh, Jeffrey tried to drug him with liquor. And so the guy comes out of the restroom and he didn't drink liquor. He drank beer. And that literally saved his life that night uh, because he was going to get drugged and, you know, bad things would have happened. But this victim, he said he walked out of the bathroom. He looked over and he said, Jeffrey Dahmer is watching The Exorcist. He's swaying back and forth and he's speaking in tongues. Now, that's another uh, aspect of my research that I think is going to be new research in the field. I think that hopefully a lot of people get on board with this, and that is the, the pathologies of these individuals, because a lot of them go into trances and they manifest memories and language preferences that transcend their own their own life experiences. Right, right. Even the Zodiac Killer, uh, when they finally hacked his code, he said, the reason I didn't kill any more people is because that those are the only souls that I needed in the afterlife. Who told him that? Right. I mean, if we're if we're getting into entities that will wear people as social skins or as biological avatars, uh, then we're going to get into possession studies and, and how it is 
that a lot of these serial killers have a predatory nature that is almost supernatural. You know what I mean? They know what, what time to get there into the house. So they, they know their, their victimology is, is almost centered around the afterlife. And it's not just that they're killing people, but they're killing people for someone or something else that's involved. I wonder where destiny lies in that, where free will lies in that. You know, if we're a soul mm-hmm. having a human experience, where we're, you know, and we're sort of predestined for this event to happen, yet I'm sure that we can change it, but we seem to, you know, some of us be aligned to go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. Is there a soul contract there, do you think? I mean, I don't know. I've been approached by multiple people who they've told me that they've had soul contracts with me, which was awkward I'm like really how did i didn't know that <laughs> but it, it does seem i mean there are various case studies where these beings will do things to us and then tell us that it was our decision you made this agreement with us before you were born and i personally have i, I have an issue with that uh because you know at some point at some point it's it's almost like hannibal lecter you're doing this to yourself and you just you're making me do this to you uh which i think there is very little proof of personally and uh i would i would need to see more case studies if you know before i make a decision um, but i'm very cautious about that i think that again if we're looking at okay you mean they're they're assaulting us because we want them to we agree to this why don't why don't we know that and why why do they know <laughs> it's yeah. very strange to me yeah i, I mean I, I know i've probably mentioned this in the other interview as well but just with, with the the work that your father's doing and has been doing and, and the work that you do, that's, that's just fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm sure he finds what you do very interesting as well. It's troubling, you know, uh, to him. At least. Sometimes we'll get into conversations and I don't want to talk about it anymore. So I'm like, okay, you know, I'll have to go bend the ear of like Dr. Barry Fitzgerald or somebody <laughs> to pick their brain, you know. Well, well um, I, I get that, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not, they're not easy subjects, are they? No, there isn't. They're, they're not, brother. Uh, you know, and sometimes the, the darkness does, it just gets too much, and then I have to unplug. I'll fly out to Rhode Island, or uh, I'll put on, I'll watch a whole season of Frasier. I love Frasier, you know, so just to kind of unwind, because again, yeah. you know, if you look too much into this, it will start affecting you. And I believe uh, the data suggests that it, that's one of the controlling mechanisms the phenomenon employs. It does not want to be understood. It, it, it wants to be believed in, but not really understood. Oh. Well, true crime is very um, popular, isn't it? It's a really popular oh, yeah. subject. Do you think that, um, in your opinion, do you think that calls things in? Or, I mean... Uh, I don't know. No. I, 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 Hopefully I not, right? That all. <laughs> Hopefully not. I mean, I know there are people that say that, uh, you know, saying the devil's name or a demon's name, you know, they'll be attracted to it. Again, I think that these beings have their own pathologies, and their own victimologies. Uh, there was a case in the uh, 17th century of a man picking apples in an orchard. And uh, this entity assaulted him and crawled into his skin, literally possessed him. And when they took him to the exorcist, they were interrogating the entity because it literally, again, it's possession. Uh, he had commandeered that man's consciousness. And upon, uh, upon talking to the entity inside, uh, the entity said, well, they said, I used to be uh, basically a murderer. I used to hurt people. And he said, the reason I picked that man was because I had committed an act of assault underneath that same tree in that same orchard. So <laughs> many of these case studies demonstrate the same high points and pathologies of serial killers, even down to these beings carving symbols underneath people's eyelids, right? What are we dealing with here? Uh, it's not just consciousness and the study of the afterlife, but it's literally people carrying on their same characteristics they had in life into the afterlife. Wow, and which how, is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, how, how do you keep your sort of um, yourself clear of of uh, this, um, you know, coming in, into your energy field too much and, mm-hmm. and and taking you over in a sense? I mean, what what's some of the things that you do? I mean, well, I, I love food, and I kind of just go into myself, really. You know, like I said, I love Frasier. 
And uh, I, I always know, like, if there's a particular case maybe that's too heavy, I'll, 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 I'll put it away. Uh, you know, there, there were, and I'll tell you what, too, uh, there have been times when I've got too, too deep into the research and they begin to manifest during my shows, uh, especially what I call the Molters. I was doing a show in Rhode Island with some good friends of mine. And before we even started recording, uh, my friend had his, her headphones on and one headphone, one side, an entity talked to another one. And on the left side of the headphone, the other entity answered him. And that's when I realized, uh oh, right, I'm getting too close. I need to back off a little bit uh, because, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to, I want to suffer the least amount of consequences while getting the most amount of knowledge I can. And and to keep your own sort of aura clean as well. I'm just using human words here, right? But to keep the I mean, as you said, that story you say about the guy with the, you know, got to, you know, was at the tree, a tree, a, a, a right. space where something, uh, some action that had nothing to do with him had been committed. Um, do you, I wonder if you've got to be at a certain energy that you've got to be a bit low yourself for that to be invited mm -hmm. in as well. It's very possible. Uh, I think what's really interesting about that was, again, this being demonstrated the characteristics of a serial killer in that he was stalking his old crime scenes. See, if we start thinking of these beings as having psychology, as having memories and, and literally operating based off of memories they had in their lifetimes, uh, then I think that it allows us the freedom and insight to look deeper. Okay, now we're starting to get into pathologies that make sense. And, and, and I think it does. I mean, if you get into these case studies over and over and over again, it's glaringly obvious. You know, the self-replication of their species, the way they can take women, the way they can take men, um, it very much mirrors criminal psychology. Yes, it does. Now, for people that want to maybe look at your work, I don't believe you've got a website, mm -hmm. but you do have social yeah. media. Correct. Correct. I'm on YouTube and I'm on Instagram and Facebook. I, I had a website, but it was just getting, getting too too much to handle in, in the midst of interviews and lectures and all of that. So I get uh, that. you can follow my YouTube page. I have my own show on the League Project called The Ghost Notes, where I give lectures uh, every Thursday. So. Okay. And your Facebook page is? YouTube. Oh, it's a... Uh, my Facebook, Nathaniel Gillis. Okay. Nathaniel Gillis. We'll put that on the screen as well. Um, Thank you, sir. And obviously your book as well. Well, there's mm -hmm. two books. Just yep. tell, very quickly, tell us about the two books. So, A Moment Called Man, uh, it was an, it's an homage to my old religious tradition. See, when I started uh, outgrowing that and growing into some new insights, I, I just kind of left that there. So it's basically about how to discover your purpose in life and uh, what I call the disfigurement of destiny, growing out of your old self, you're growing into something that you you will love more and that you were designed to be. Uh, and that's a moment called Man. The other book is obviously it's about my my research into demonology. It's called The Skin That Crawls. And I talk about the molters and how they use possession as a form of pregnancy. Uh, so it, we'll see, right? <laughs> a lot of people will, will uh, find it distasteful, but I think that it does serve a role in the field, at least if at least just to raise a red flag for us all to pay attention to. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. That's very interesting, the book, A Moment Called Man. Yeah, you're finding your purpose. And, and what was one of the keys to that, to really finding yourself? I mean, obviously, I'm guessing you applied this for yourself as well. Yeah, well, the, the, one of the concepts that I introduce is, is pain, especially with people that have the empathic nature. We feel a lot. And I think that See, it all came from my heart, too. So one of the principles that I put in the book is the fact that the pain that you feel is the pain you can heal. And the whole idea is there's a lot of pains that I cannot identify with. I, I've never experienced it. But the pain that I have, them, that's how I can connect to others who, have, who are going through what I went through. Uh, so that's really what it's about. It's, it's a major book right now in the addiction community. Uh, because there's a lot of impacts that, you know, they don't understand. They cannot self-medicate someone else's pain. You can only manifest it. So in the manifestation, I know this sounds a little bit woo, but it really no, it is doesn't. No, relevant. no, that's really interesting. So um, we'll just, just go a little bit deeper into that. So uh, yeah. I, I, I can understand pain. So what you're saying is, I guess, that, uh, you know, the more painful it was, the more you got to realize I've got to make some changes in a sense or... Yeah, yeah. So 
I, I start out talking about uh, understanding yourself and understanding why we suffer so much in life. I deal with scars and, and how that in those scars, there are words. In your wounds, there are words that are created to help others who are going through the same pain. And so I, I, I deal with uh, just, it's, it gets, it, it's really rough, I should say, because I get into, you know, how to understand yourself. I talk about uh, Evan the beaver who was rescued from a puddle. They all thought he was a rat because he was missing a tail. He was actually a beaver. and He was going through the house, tearing everything up. And so the family originally thought that, you know, this is, we got to get rid of him. This rat is eating everything. What they didn't know was he was destroying everything to build. I just got chills to build for his family, which they were. And so the whole concept evolved around, hey, listen, if you're in the right place and you find your position in life, everything that, that you would see as destruction will be actually you building something. So it's more about understanding yourself and manifesting who you're supposed to be. And that's the process that you went through as well. You, you can actually apply that to your life. Yes, yes, yes. So the way we love others is uh, it's a manifestation of how we love ourselves. If I don't love me, I'll never understand how to love you. And so I had to create a relationship with my own wounds, right? I had to love myself again. And then once I found out how to do that, from that foundation is how I start to interact with people and embrace them for who they are as well. And I guess part of that journey was being true to yourself. Yes, yes. These aren't, yeah, these aren't blemishes. They're blessings. The, these are something that I was designed to, to uh, inhabit. So I, I talk about the, what I call the um, disfigurement of destiny. Right, because everybody, especially if you're in that position where you don't know who you're supposed to be, you feel disfigured because you you don't recognize yourself, and so it's it's a lot of cognitive dissonances. I know who I want to be, but I don't know who that will be. It's very interesting. But you're in a good place now, and this is, and you're doing exactly what you, you know, write yeah. in the book. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, I, I had no idea it was about that. That's really fascinating. Okay, well, those books have been coming up on the screen as well. Again, we'll link those in the description along with anything else that we've discussed as well. Websites, URLs are all down there. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, any last message? Well, I think uh, I've told people this before. Uh, these beings are playing by different rules because they're playing a different game. And that's what my colleagues and I are trying to understand. What game are they playing? But Kevin, thank you for having me on, my friend. It's always a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so, so much. And um, until next time, thank you.